My name is Alan Goldstein. I'm an interpretive naturalist at the Falls of Ohio State Park. An interpretive naturalist is basically a park educator. Hi, my name is Paul Mayer and I'm the Fossil Invertebrate Collections Manager at the Field Museum. These are the weirdly coiled ammonites from the Cretaceous. So these were swimming around in the sea when the T-Rex was walking around on the land. That's a nice slab here. I am Ken Angelzik. I'm the Associate Curator of Paleomammalogy at the Field Museum of Natural History. Here is a skull of a Permian synapsa that's probably about 280 or 85 million years old. And this is a, a specimen that's probably about 200 or 205 million years old. It's a little Mesozoic mammal called Morganucodon, and it's one of the first things that shows up in the fossil record that would actually be, if you saw it walking down the street, something that you would recognize as a mammal. So there's its skull. You can see it's a very small mammal. I'm Dr. Belinsky, and I teach geology and paleontology here at Bellman University in the School of Environmental Studies. These are little rolled up trilobites. How do we deal with these specimens when we collect them? Um, who should have them? Should they be sold? Should they not be sold? Laws make it more difficult to collect now than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Every country has its own sort of rules and regulations about um, what you can do with fossils there. Um, and in many ways, the um, laws in the U.S. are among some of the most lax of anywhere you go. So in Tanzania and Zambia, fossils are considered national heritage objects, and as such are considered property of the, the people of those countries. More countries are forbidding fossil collecting in their country, you know, which is, you know, they, they, view, they, they view fossils as a, as a, in the same category as they do archaeological stuff, which is, you know, cultural remains. I mean, I think they're, they're parallel to each other, but they're not related to each other specifically. And so in both Tanzania and Zambia, um, fossils were first discovered in the areas that we work in um, the early 1930s. And the first expeditions to collect fossils took place kind of shortly thereafter and have gone on sort of sporadically over the course of the 20th century. All those fossils, though, have gone to other places. So there's some in Germany, there's some in the UK, there's some in South Africa, but none have really stuck around um, in Tanzania or Zambia. And so our collections will really be the first kind of major collections of, of fossils from um, those places that actually stay in the countries of origin, um, which I think is an important sort of uh, bit of capacity building that we're, we're helping to, to do in those countries. The other thing, of course, is which, which is almost somewhat ironic, is that some of the fossil deposits are actually quarries. So, oh yeah, you can't take a, you can't collect fossils, but you can grind them into gravel. So, when you're working with um, privately owned land, um, including land owned by corporations like a quarry, uh, you have to get permission to access them. Um, sometimes it's an issue of safety, public safety. So, um, if you're working in an, an industrially um, active place like a quarry, uh, sometimes it's hard to get access just for for that reason. Um, but sometimes they they're freely allow people to um, access it or they will deliver some of their extra rock that they don't use and you can um, pick through the fossils there. So they're, they're good partners, um, you know, they're looking out for their own um, kind of liability issues. Uh, some states have different laws about whether you can collect on, on the public land or whether you need permits. Um, Especially when we're talking about things like national parks, you need to have permits to conduct research in those places. I think it used to be a lot easier to get into, but now with uh, uh, insurance companies and, and other problems, I think it's a lot harder to get access to them. Paleontology has a long-standing relationship with amateur collectors. We are one of those disciplines of study where um, amateurs have a really important role to play for public education. There's a lot of people that are hobbyists. They, they like to study these sorts of things. And that's a really big asset to our field of study. Um, a lot of times they're very knowledgeable and sometimes will even publish papers. Uh, the Paleontological Society, which is the major paleontology organization in our country, actually gives out an award every year to, to an amateur paleontologist who's contributed a lot to um, the nature of the discipline. So we really value that and sometimes that um, really 
uh, helps to advance the science. Um, the problem is when there's someone who is um, trying to exploit uh, the fossils and um, sell them to, for their own gain without any um, kind of collaboration with professional organizations. I think uh, amateur collecting is a great way for people to learn about science, a great way for people to get interested in fossils, and uh, generally a, a very good thing but most of the time. Uh, maybe it can get carried away and people can collect too much. If you were in a situation where fossils are being collected to essentially be decorations within someone's house that never get to see the, the light of day sort of scientifically or educationally, that's part of that history that we're, we're losing potentially forever. Um, and I, like I say, my, my personal opinion is that that's a very unfortunate thing. I certainly understand the attraction of fossils and I'm, I'm very privileged to, to be able to work on them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but I think that it's important that we make sure that they're accessible to everyone. You know, even with some regulations in place, people will still be finding and, and learning about fossils. So um, there might be some kind of hiccups or bumps in the road for, for collectors or for, um, for paleontologists, professionals, um, but I think that we'll still be able to carry on and, and do what we need to do.